Lord, I want to thank you for this morning. Uh, Lord, I just want to thank you for the opportunity that you've given us. Lord, just come in this place and worship you. Uh, Lord, to celebrate uh, hard work, um, to celebrate new life. Um, Lord, to celebrate new adventures uh, and new challenges that face us. Uh, Lord, as we, uh, as we dive into your word this morning, Lord, would we look at uh, and just grasp on to what it looks like just to, uh, for every day to be a righteous day for us as we look at the words of King David uh, and the psalm that he wrote. And so, Lord, as we continue on in worship this morning, would you just be honored and glorified through it all. We stand and pray. Amen. Y'all go ahead and stand. Amen. Y'all stand and worship with it. It is pretty awesome we got a grad up here with us uh, playing this morning, uh, that we've got the young folks involved, that they are. Uh, and we thank them so much for, uh, let's give them a hand one more time as they go out. That's awesome. It's a great thing. You guys going out, working, going to college, doing your thing, and uh, some of you are getting off the payroll for the parents, and they all love that too. So anyway, this morning, we want to sing about the heavens this morning. Open up the heavens this morning as we sing. Waited for this day, gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening his eye, burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, feeling every part of our breath. Your presence in this place, glory in your face, looking. Descending like a cloud, standing with us now, Lord, unveil your eyes. You're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing. Open up the hymns, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Open up the hills, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our breath. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us. Show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our being. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Every part of Scott, could you share with uh, Anderson and all the madness? I forgot to get him a machine. He's good, but he ain't that good. <laughs>
There you go. We want to sing this one this morning. Uh, the same God that was with us, we've been reading the Old Testament, and the same God that was with David is the same God that's with you kids, is the same God with us here, is the same God with us in the future. God bless us as we go. Thank you so much for all you graduates, and we want to bless them this morning. Let's sing this one. It's a newer one, but the youth all know it, so I wanted to do it for them this morning. It's called Same God. I'm calling on the God of Jacob. Whose love endures to generation. I know that you will keep your covenant. Calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same. Oh God, oh my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Yeah. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Yeah. Calling on the God of Mary, whose favor is upon the Lord. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd for the rich. I may not face Goliath, but I got my own giant. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Hey. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Yeah. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, oh God, I need you now. How I need you now. Yeah. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Yeah. You heard your children then, you hear your children now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God, you are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a healer then. You are a healer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were a savior then. You are a savior now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. 
children know you can you can head on out to children's church if you want to um henry's excited there's a lot of them All right, um, let's go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 5 today. That is where we're going to be at uh, for our message this morning. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in the same uh, seat as the high school graduates. Um, They did the pom-pom circumstance. I walked into the room. Uh, Everybody was taking pictures of me. Um... And I sat down in the same seat that, uh, that they sat down in. Um, and we listened to a speaker. We had our names called. We walked across the stage. We got, um, we shook the hands of the pastor and we walked off the stage. Um, and as I, as I left church that morning, I was excited for where God was, where I thought um, God was leading me. Uh, I was going to go to North Greenville University, major in business. I was going to run my own hunting and fishing store. Uh, we was going to have a verse and a Christian theme to go along with it, but my main reason for doing it was to make money. Um, and I was going to go major in business from North Greenville, and I was going to leave there, and, and because I love hunting, because I love fishing, uh, that's what I was going to do. Uh, and so I was preparing myself financially uh, to be successful in life. Um, I wanted to drive a big truck. I wanted to live in a big house. Uh, I wanted to have a massive yard. Um, but I was on a mission trip in Boston that summer, uh, and our youth pastor at the time had just recently uh, left the church, so we were without one. My dad was actually the leader of the trip. For some reason, I don't know why they chose him, but he was. Uh, and so he, uh, he took us to Boston. We were on a mission trip there, and we were um, trying to get the name of, of the church there uh, out to the community. Um, because it was a fairly new church, and, and they didn't have a lot of members. Um, and so we were handing granola bars out. We were walking the streets. We were talking to people. And, and one day uh, while we were walking, I came up, well, the group that I was with, we came up uh, and across a group of high school boys, and they were outside an apartment complex throwing the football. Um, and so I, I played football in high school. And, and so I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just going to go throw some football and, and hang out with these dudes and chill with them. Um, and so as we were doing it, uh, I, at one point I was just like, hey, are, do y'all want to come to church with us? Or do y'all want to go to church on Sunday to Church 180? Um, and one of them looked at me and, and said, uh, well, will you be there also? Um, and like any good short-term mission trip, we were leaving Saturday um, after. And so we weren't going to be there on Sunday morning. Uh, and it was at this point where God pricked my heart and said, you know what, Graham, I want you to be in ministry. Uh, I want you to hang out with students. I want you to be with students. I want you to love on students. Uh, but ultimately, I want you to lead students to the feet of Jesus. And so uh, I think the week after that, I changed my major from business management to youth ministry uh, and arrived at North Greenville University on August the 8th. Yes, that's a little bit early. Uh, for most college graduates, because um, I thought that I was going to be a superstar in college football, Uh, when in reality, uh, I just got beat up for the next two years of my life, Um, because 
they're a lot bigger than me, a lot stronger than me, and a lot faster than me. Uh, and so I played scout offense against the starting uh, nose guard who was 300 pounds, uh, and I just got whooped every single day uh, of my life um, while I was in college. And so I got there on August the 8th, and as I walked into the locker room, one of the older football players was there just greeting us, and he looked at me and he said, whose younger brother are you? I was like, dang, um, I'm actually a freshman. I'm supposed to be starting college in a couple of weeks, and I'm playing football with you guys. Uh, and he just kind of laughed and walked away. And it was at this point, <laughs> it was at this point when I realized I was no longer the top dog at school. I was the lowest of the lows at school. Um, and so for the next two years, I would wake up at 5 a.m., I'd work out, uh, I'd go to school all day, we'd have practice, uh, I'd go eat dinner, we would um, then do homework until midnight most nights, and I'd go to bed and I'd wake up at 5 a.m. the next morning and, and do it all over again for two years. Um, and I, I would say that that was probably one of the most challenging, in my notes here I said it was the closest thing to hell. Um, I didn't, know if, <laughs> I didn't know if I could say that, but I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, that, was, that was my first two years of college. Um, and that's, that's what I felt like. I was getting beat up. Um, obviously, Parker was there. Um, but everything that was going on, she didn't make it hell. I promise, guys, okay? Uh, it was everything else around it that was going on. Um, but I, I, I say all this to say that... College, for the first couple of years, whooped my butt. Uh, and, and for some of you seniors graduating uh, and going off to college, the first couple of years could potentially whoop your butt. And it's going to be tough, and it's going to be challenging. You're going to have to learn how to study harder. You're going to have to learn how to manage your time better. Uh, you're going to have to learn how to ha spend your free time wisely. But you're also going to learn how to have some fun. And you're going to have to learn when to do it and how to do it. Um, and so I did it um, because God had a specific plan for my life. He knew that when I graduated, well, this December of my senior year, uh, I'd get a call from First Baptist Landrum. And you guys would ask me to come on uh, kind of staff here to be your interim student pastor for a little while. Uh, and then go part-time and now be full-time for a little over two years. And so God had a specific plan for my life. Yes, it seemed tough. Yes, it, it seemed challenging. But God has plans for each and every person's life in this room. Um, and so that's the first reason I tell that story. Second off, as we look at this passage today, you're going to find yourself in the same predicament that David finds himself in. Where he's got enemies and he's got challenges and he's got all these things going on in life around him. And he can't do nothing else but look up to the Lord. He can't do anything else but cry out to the Lord in the state that he's in um, because, as, as we know about David, he was a man after God's own heart. And so in the midst of challenges, in the midst of hardships, in the midst of trials and everything that's going on in his life, he calls out to the Father. And so for, not just for the graduates, but for each and every person in this room, this is going to happen in our lives. And when it does, where do we go and who do we call out to? Um, because I, I think in order for us to, to be the people that God has called us to be, we have to be people of righteousness. And it can't happen unless we resemble the same person that David was here in this passage. And so this is our challenge this morning to us as a congregation and as seniors and everybody in this room. And so I'm all, we're going to read Psalm chapter 5. It says this, listen to my words, Lord, consider my lament, hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. If you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness, with, with you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate, you hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful you, Lord, detest. But I, by your great love, can come into your house in reverence I bow down toward your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Not a, not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their hearts is filled 
With malice, their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they tell lies. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their in- intrigues be their downfall. Banish them from their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I pray that as, uh, as, I, as I'm up here and as, as I give this message that you have prepared for me, Lord, would I do you the honor and the favor of glorifying your name through it all. Lord, as we leave this place this morning, Lord, may you be honored and glorified by the way that we live, by the way that we apply it to our lives. In his name I pray. Amen. And so David here, he's crying out to God because he has nowhere else to go. He's surrounded. His enemies are all around him. Life is crumbling down upon him. Uh, and what he does is, is he cries out to the Lord. And so the title of this morning's message is A Righteous uh, Every day a righteous, I was looking for my title, I forgot it for a second. Um, Every day a righteous day. Because David, a man after God's own heart, prays this prayer to the Lord. And so if we want to be people after God's own heart, we have to do the same thing. And so this morning, David does three things that shows us what a righteous person does. How he makes every day a righteous day. And so we're reminded of three things. Number one, we have to and we must remember who God is. David starts this passage off with, listen to my words, Lord. In the Hebrew language, when he says, Lord, this word is Jehovah. And there's a certain sentiment and understanding that comes from us as God's created beings as we call him and when we call him Lord. He is the self-sufficient, self-existent God and creator of the universe, and he loves us. And as David begins this time of prayer to the Lord, he calls out to Jehovah, his self-sufficient, self-existent creator of the universe. David remembers who God is in his life. David has a reverence to his God, and we need to understand that God has an ear for his people. He wants us to call out to him. He's waiting for us to to come before him uh, and just to to call him Lord of our lives. And this is where David starts right here in Psalm 5, verse 1. Listen to my words, Jehovah. Consider my lament. God is... I mean, I mean, he, he says it in the Bible, I am who I am. There's no greater words to describe who God is except for just understanding that God is God. He is the ruler of the universe. He is king of our lives. He is self-existent. He is our creator. Uh, and, in, and in him and through him and, and because of him, all things exist. And David here begins this prayer understanding that. And God has always been ready to hear from the call of his people. And David knows that this time is no different. The time that David's in in his life is a time to go before the Lord. And, and I mean, we got a whole book of, of Psalm where, where David goes before the, I mean, I can't even, fl- I just flipped four times, I can't even get to the end of it. Where David goes before the Lord again and again and again and again and again. Because he can't get through life without God. He can't make a single day worth it without God. And David recognizes the intimacy of having this relationship with God. That's the only reason he can go before God in this circumstance is because he's got this intimate relationship with God. And so he calls out to him, Jehovah. Listen to my words, Jehovah. Consider my lament. And then he continues, hear my cry, For help, my king and my God, for to you I pray. And so he first calls him Lord, Jehovah. And then he continues on with king. And so I I ask myself, well, who is a king? What is a king? And it's someone to whom we have sworn allegiance to. Um, 
I didn't grow up in medieval times. I didn't grow up with a king. I have a president. Um, but to a king, and, and we see it, I think one of the best ones or examples is Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah, the, the walls of Jerusalem are torn down. The city is just demolished, and he wants to go and rebuild them so that he can establish the place uh, for God's people again. And in order to do it, he's got to go before the king and ask for his permission. If he doesn't and he gets caught, he can be killed. And David, as he's writing this, David is king. But yet he calls out to God as his king. So David, we see, has sworn allegiance to God, but it's also someone who we have put ourselves under as our protection. Because the king's in charge of the military, the king's in charge of um, the decrees and everything that's going on in the land. Uh, and so to David, God is in charge of all these things in his life. God is his protection. God is his ruler. God is the one to whom he goes before and asks for permission. God is the one to whom David goes before on his knees. God is, God is the one who, to whom David just goes before and cries out before, and he can't do anything without God's permission. And David understands... God's authority in his life. Because that's really what a king is. He's the authority of our lives. And so when we look at what it looks like for every day to be a righteous day, a man after God's own heart, David here, as he goes before God, he remembers first off who he is in his life. That God is his Lord, that God is his Jehovah, that God is his king. And so to us in this room, if every day is going to be a righteous day for us, as David, as, because in verse 3 it says in the morning, so David's doing this in the morning. And so as, as David starts his day off, he starts off with, Lord, you're, God, you're my Lord. God, you're my King. And without you in being in my life and without you ruling over my life, I can't do anything. I don't have the power. I don't have the authority. Uh... I don't even have the privilege to be doing what I'm doing. And this is, this is King David. And he goes before the Lord with this cry and with this plea. And so I, wanna, I want us to ask ourselves a question this morning. Is God your Jehovah? Is God your king? Because as David starts off this passage, he has to remember and recognize who God is in his life. And then, second off, uh, as we're going to see in verse 7, David recognizes his need for grace. So he recognizes who God is, that he is Lord, that he is Jehovah of his life, that he's king of his life. But then he also recognizes his need for grace. It says, verse 3, In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you and wait expectantly for you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness with you evil people are not welcome the arrogant cannot stand in your presence you hate all who do wrong you destroy those who tell lies the bloodthirsty and deceitful you Lord detest and I and I put a if you want to highlight this circle it square it do something beside verse 7 because it says but I by your great love can come into your house and reverence I bow down toward your holy temple. There's two sides to the God that we serve. He's a just God, and he's a loving God. Because of our sin, because of our separation before him, we, there, there's only one consequence, and that's eternal separation from God for eternity. And, and, and the ones who deserve that are like what David says here, it's the wicked, it's the evil, it's the arrogant, uh, it's all those who do wrong, it's the ones who tell lie. It's the murderers, it's the deceitfuls. And so, as, as David begins, he's got all these things going. He's got enemies and enemies and enemies, and everything's coming, on, coming against him. And he takes this plea before the Lord because he understands who God is. And God encompasses both just and love perfectly as our God and as our King. And David recognizes it and, and writes about it here. Uh, in this passage, David expresses his confidence 
and who God is as he gives us a glimpse into the person and character of his king. And so it says, God is not pleased with wickedness. He does not welcome evil people. Arrogant cannot stand in his presence. He hates all who do wrong. He destroys those who tell lies. He detests murderers and those who are deceitful. And so God is just. These people, the wicked, the evil, the arrogant, the deceitful, the murderers, they can't be in the presence of God. And David recognizes it, and he understands it. Because God is just, but he also is love. And too often, I think churches, we focus on the love side of God, but we skip over the just side. He does judge us for everything that we do, for our sins, and, and because of it, Jesus had to be sent to die on a cross for our sins. That's the only way that we won't be judged. That's the only way that we will never um, spend eternity separated from God. And so God is just, but just like, God, just like David mentions um, here in verse 1, he is Jehovah. He is the all-encompassing being who created all, sustains all, is in all, and through whom all things happen. That's why God has the privilege to be just. That's why God has the privilege to judge us and, and, and to not allow us into his presence for eternity. Because he is Jehovah. He is our king. But David here also so shows us grace. Um, and for some, some, somehow, some way, some form, some fashion, David understands salvation. Here, Jesus hasn't come yet. Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. Jesus hasn't raised from the grave yet. But here we see a glimpse into David's intimate relationship with God the Father. And it's in verse 7. And it says, But I, by your great love, by your grace, Father, I can come into your house. In reverence to you, I bow down towards your holy temple. Because of God's grace, David can come into the house of the Lord and bow down before him. Only because of God's grace. And I think for us in this room this morning, seniors, uh, college graduates, parents, grandparents, and every person in between, this should be the key to our life. Grasping onto the grace that God has for us. Um, in Ephesians, uh, we see grace, and it's, we see that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not of works that you've done so that you can't boast, but only because we can boast like David is in who God is in his life. This is what David is doing here in verse 7. He's boasting in who God is. He's not boasting in himself because he says, but by your great love. It's not by what David's done. It's not by the fact that he killed Goliath. It's not by the fact that he's a man after God's own heart. It's not by the fact that he's led the nation of Israel, that he's done this and this and this and this. It's only by God's grace can he come into God's presence and bow down before him. And it's the same with us in this room. It's nothing that you can do. It's nothing that you've ever done that you can be in the presence of God. It's only because of his grace. Because of his great love, because he sent Jesus to die on a cross for your sins. King David was an adulteress. He was a murderer. He was deceitful. But yet he was still considered a man after God's own Heart. David checks, by the way, David checks three of the boxes that he just talked about in verses four through six. I just want us to, under, David checks three of the boxes that he wrote about. But he also understands God's grace. And he understands God's love. And he recognizes his own need for grace. And apart from grace, all of us in this room, we're doomed for hell. 
I think this morning it's time that we finally realize our own need for grace. Nothing you've ever done. No works you can do, no mission trips you can go on, no calling that you can do, no amount of times of, that you serve in this church or, or whatever you do, you can't do anything to earn your way. It's only by God's grace can you be there and can you have the privilege to bow down in his own presence. And there's also people in this room that you need to understand that there's no distance too far for you to run and no act of injustice too evil that you can do that God will never forgive. Because David checks three of his own boxes off. And he recognizes that because of God's grace, he could still have eternal life and be in the presence of God. And so for the seniors in this room and for the graduates, as you leave here and as you go off to college, you need to understand, number one, in your life, you've got to remember who God is. You've got to remember that he is your Lord. You've got to remember that he is your king, that he is your protection, that he is your guidance. That through him and in him and only because of him do things ever happen. God is our king. God is our Jehovah. And we need to also recognize that he sent Jesus as grace so that we can have eternal life. David recognizes his need for grace. If David, an evil man convicted of adultery, murder, and deceit, can be considered a man after God's own heart, so can we but only if we recognize our need for grace. Grace is the most powerful thing God's ever given us. And all we've got to do is grasp onto it. All we've got to do is say yes to it. And then lastly, after David remembers who God is, after David recognizes his need for grace, he then relies on God as his deliverer. It says here in verse 8, lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. I love it that he starts everyone off with Lord. He goes back to the remembering who God is in his life. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their hearts is filled with malice. Their throats is an open grave. With their tongues they tell lies. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. God is David's leader. The king of Israel, God is his leader. Who leads your life? Who do you follow? When God is your Lord and King, He's the only one that can ever be your leader. When, when you surrender your life to Him, when you swear your allegiance to Him, when you see Him as Jehovah, when you see Him as the self-existent, self-efficient, sufficient God over your life, He's the only leader you'll ever have. And he's the only leader you'll ever need. God is our king. He's our Jehovah. He's also our deliverer. And in the midst of struggle, and in the midst of his last days, David draws near to the Lord. And it's not one of woes. It's not one of, Lord, my, my life is terrible. It's not one of that. But it's, it's one of rejoice because David understands God's great love for himself. David understands God's great love for him. And when life comes at you with all distractions, you have no choice but to rely on the Lord. You have no choice but to remember who he is in your life. And remember his grace and rely on him as your leader. There is a traditional race in ancient Greece that is still widely celebrated today. The name of this special race was the Lampada de Romeo. That's a big word, Lampada de Romeo. And unlike our races today, the first person that crossed the finish line didn't win. It was the team that crossed with their lamp still lit, with their torch, with their fire still ablaze. That was the one who won this race 
in ancient Greece. And as I look at the seniors and the graduates and the families this morning in this room, if we're going to be like King David, and as we talked about this morning in Sunday school, if we're going to leave a legacy, if we're going to be legends for the Lord, our torch must continue to stay lit for eternity. Our torch must continue to stay lit wherever the Lord leads us. And in order to stay righteous and in order for our torches to continue to be lit, we've got to remember who God is. We've got to recognize our need for grace. And we've got to rely on God as our deliverer. That's our call this morning. May God be your Lord. May God be your Jehovah. May God be your King. May His grace abound over your life. May He be your deliverer and your protector.